But I want to show you here that there's an agenda. There definitely is. Here we have page 293. Look what he says. Within two years, uh, many men will be teaching the pre-wrath rapture. Within five years, it will be a recognized position. And if God pleases, within 15 years, it will become a major position of the believing church if God gives that many years. See, when was this book written? See, I got my little uh, warning down there. Book is to be used for documentation purposes only. Okay. For after the catching away of the body of Christ, I don't want people getting messed up with this. Copyright 1990. Ironic because right about the time that this book came out is about the time that, uh, ra uh, that uh, Stephen Anderson got his revelation from God as a 12-year-old boy that the body of Christ goes into the uh, time of Jacob's trouble. Interesting. There is an agenda to attack those of us that believe the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away. Absolutely. Wrath of God here on page 15 of Ken Hoven's book. Wrath of God here. The great day of his wrath is mentioned scores of times in Scripture. This is not to be confused with the time of tribulation. Tribulation is what the world does to believers. Wrath is what God does to the world. The book of Revelation. Chapter 5. Okay. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to, and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And he goes down through over here in chapter 6. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. That right there is the unleashing of the Antichrist. Who unleashes the Antichrist? The New World Order, the Illuminati. They bring in the New World Order. No, they don't. You say, who does? The Lord. Why? Because Israel rejected their king. They rejected God ruling over them in the person of Jesus Christ. And so the Lord says, hey, they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. They want a king? We'll give you King Saul. And ironic, who comes after King Saul? King David. Jesus Christ comes back and sits up his throne on the seat or on the throne of David. David being a type of Christ. Nothing to it, I'm sure, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, let me see, I gotta find a verse here. Zephaniah. Let's go back to the Old Testament. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 8. Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I Rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. The first three and a half years of the time or the tribulation, and there's no God's wrath. What do you think that is right there? Well, I don't see the word wrath. Well, then you're not very bright, okay? Uh, it, the word wrath isn't in there, but I think that you can kind of, you know, understand that that's wrath, you know? Pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. When does God's wrath begin? With the arrival of the Antichrist. Right there. You're seeing it. Zephaniah 3.8. This hasn't happened yet. God hasn't assembled all the world governments together so he can pour upon them his fierce anger. That hasn't happened yet. This is a future prophecy. And when is it fulfilled? Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. It all ties together. See? Rightly dividing the word of truth. That's what's going on here. Ken Hovind, 
unfortunately, is not doing it because the false prophet that deceived him, Roland Rasmussen, does not tell him how to properly divide the word of truth. I care very much about Ken Hoven. That's why I'm doing this study. Very, very thorough and in-depth study. I'm not going to leave any stone unturned, so to speak. Okay, here we have page 18. He says, we are about to enter that final seven years of man's futile attempts to rule the world. Uh, no, we're not. If you're saved, you're leaving. Uh, man cannot bring in that kingdom until the body of Christ has been removed. Just as simple as that. All right? And we're going to talk about this proof here as we continue. You're going to see that there are saved, redeemed, bought by the blood of the Lamb, people from every kindred or tongue nation in heaven, before the first seal is open. You say, where's the proof of that? Well, I'll show you. I mean, I have been preaching on this subject since 2009. Uh, I was calling out Anderson, Stephen Anderson, way back then. I heard about this and I saw this whole thing and I said back in 2009, you can listen to my post-trib thieves study, and I said way back, he's gonna fall for replacement theology eventually. And years and years and years, oh, you're crazy, you know, everything. Years went by, 2014, he comes out, uh, am I teaching replacement theology? Well, yes, yes. And now he comes out and openly, you know, makes propaganda films attacking the nation of Israel. And again, you know, Ken Hoven, I saw uh, somebody, you know, alerted me to this, and they said Ken Hoven came out and said, don't blame me for being part of Stephen Anderson's, you know, film and stuff. I was just interviewed. I understand that. I understand that. But... Ken Hoven, if you're watching, you need to get very far away from Stephen Anderson. He is controlled opposition. Uh, he is a, a minister of Satan. Uh, he is very, very, very hateful, calling for the death of the president, calling for sodomites to be uh, executed, making very radical statements. The news media loves him. Even Obama mentions him by name. I mean, he's controlled opposition. Uh, he, he'd be a nothing, a nobody, if it wasn't for the fact that he stood up to the border patrol and they beat him up. Uh, he, he's, he's a nobody. But here's the problem. He is trying to bring the world's hatred upon those of us that hold to the King James Bible. That's his purpose. All right. He's trying to bring a curse upon this nation, trying to get Christians to turn against the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, which is God has plans for them in the end times. But um, Revelation chapter 5, let's talk about this here. Okay, chapter 5. Verse 8, And when he had taken the, bo the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. That's how, right there, this is how you know it's not just Old Testament Jews and New Testament Jews, you know, the twenty-four elders. Not true. They're not from every kindred and tongue and people and nation. It's talking about Christians. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. How is it that they have millennial reign given to them if this is somehow before the, the rapture and the judgment seat of Christ? No, the rapture had to have taken place before this event, and they are crowned, and they have millennial reign. So their rewards have been given to them. Another very strong proof for the pre-time of Jacob's trouble. You say, well, that's only 24 elders. Keep reading. Verse 11, And I beheld and he I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Okay? So, Ken Hoven also goes into the thing in this book, and he'll say, that's 100 million. Uh, no, because it's, it's actually an a undetermined amount. Thousands of thousands. In other words, John's just looking out and he's going 10 times, 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. He's just looking and going, there's too many for me to count. So we don't really know the number of, of people that are within the body of Christ um, down through the last, you know, almost 2,000 years. So you see that there. Well, let's continue. Let's go back to Ken Hoven's book here, page 19. Appendix 4b, the first three and a half years covers the temple being built and many Christians falling away from the Lord for a wide range of reasons. Uh, no, it does not. Okay, that's not true. Well, 
his appendix does, but I'm saying not true. And again, let me ask the question. Many Christians are going to fall away. They aren't going to endure to the end. Okay, what happens to them? Christians fall away, take the mark of the beast, go along with the system. What happens to them? And I showed you earlier in Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11, anybody takes the mark of the beast, they face God's wrath. And when does the mark of the beast come in? With the Antichrist. When does that start? The beginning of the time of Jacob's trouble. So the wrath is there from the beginning. God assembles the kingdom so that he can pour out his fierce anger and indignation and the jealousy. The wrath is there from the beginning. And you know, well, the word wrath is not mentioned. Well, you know, you're just playing little word games. Okay, if I say I got so mad, I just went up to the guy and just shook him and I just I just beat him up and everything, you wouldn't say, oh, there was no wrath involved there because he didn't use the word wrath. <laughs> You'd say, well, of course he had wrath. I mean, he was angry. He, he physically was violent with people and stuff like this. He had indignation. Just because I didn't say the word wrath in, in describing what happened, uh, that doesn't mean that there was no wrath involved. You, see, little word games that these people play. It's incredible. But here we have page 20. It says that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Okay? Again, we've talked about that thing. Paul said that that day, day of Christ, cannot come until two things happen. Now, we see this over and over again all through this book. Ken Hoven will read verses 1 through 3 in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and he will stop. He will not read the next couple of verses because the next couple of verses debunk what he's trying to teach here. And I'm going to show you that. Two things have to happen, you know, before the rapture, he would say. A falling away and the man of sin be revealed. Okay, so you see it there. The man of sin would be the Antichrist who is revealed when he breaks the treaty in the middle of the 70th week. No, it is not. No, it is not. The man of sin is revealed when God opens the first seal. Okay? Now, yeah, it, it's, he becomes you know, much more abominable and much more wicked when he stands in the holy place and he starts to make himself into God. That's true. Sure, I agree with that. But him being revealed when he signs that peace treaty, you know, people aren't going to go, oh, you know, okay. I mean, if the body of Christ was going into it, we wouldn't be like, oh, the peace treaty was signed by this guy that is professing to be Jesus Christ and he's causing people to take the mark and whatever else. Well, that can't be the Antichrist because, you know, he's not actually in the temple yet. No, 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 no. Ridiculous. But let me show you here. Let me show you what Ken Hoven is keeping out. And again, I don't hold Ken Hoven responsible. It's, it's Rasmussen. It's these other false prophets that are deceiving him. Guaranteed. And Hoven has not been taught how to rightly divide the word of truth. Therefore, he is a workman that needs to be ashamed. And again, I don't say that out of malice or hatred or anything for Ken Hoven. Uh, he's a great man, but he's wrong. Okay. Let no man deceive you by any means. This is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, how about that one, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Now, pause <laughs> right there. Okay, um, where is the temple of God right now? For a Christian? Your body. I'm not saying me. Your body. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. All right? The Holy Ghost dwells within your body. Wait a second then. Uh, you know, where does it say it here? So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God. So the Antichrist is going to sit in the bodies of Christians? See the problem? You see the problem that you get into when you don't rightly divide the word of truth. No, the body of Christ leaves 
and that unique indwelling of the Holy Spirit within our bodies, our bodies being the temples of the Holy Ghost, walking around, that situation is gone now. And now in the time of Jacob's trouble, you have a situation there where somebody can be saved, but if they take the mark of the beast and worship the beast, the Holy Ghost leaves and says, bye-bye, you just took the mark, the, the, the mark of the beast and you're worshiping the beast. Sorry, if any man take the, the mark and worship the beast, you get the wrath of God upon you. See? The temple is going to be rebuilt. But right now, for Christians, there is no temple of God other than your body. It's important to get that. But let's continue here. Verse 6. Look at this. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. He might be revealed in his time time. What's that about? Who's the he? The man of sin, the Antichrist. Who's the his time? Oh, what time period are we in right now? Acts chapter 11, verse 26, they were called Christians first in Antioch. Jewish disciples called Christians. You're saved. You're a Christian. You are in Christ. What would be the his time then? This time here belongs to Jesus Christ, the time of the Gentiles, as the Bible talks about. Where God, between the 69th and the 70th week of Daniel, he says, okay, here's a special time. I'm going to deal with the Gentile nations to provoke the nation of Israel to jealousy. That's what's going on. So we see there in verse 6, now you know what withholdeth that the Antichrist, there he, might be real, revealed in the time, the church age. Christ's time, his time, is what you're seeing there. Let's continue. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. The Antichrist, that spirit's already there. Only he who now letteth will let, the Holy Spirit letting him, hindering him from showing up, until he, the body of Christ, his time, see it, he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Second coming, Revelation chapter 19. That's when that happens. Right here. We need to be taken out of the way. The body of Christ is taken out of the way before the man of sin is revealed. You say, I need to see proof of that. Uh, here we go. I need to see proof. I don't see it. You're not showing me it from Scripture. It's not clear to me. Well... And you need to open your eyes because you obviously aren't looking. John called up to heaven. Blood redeemed saints, Christians in heaven. Revelation chapter 6. Jesus Christ with his body now present in heaven. Glorified saints in heaven. Okay? Crowned given millennial reign. We're up there in heaven and he unleashes the Antichrist. You see? He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Did you get that? I'm still not convinced. Okay, go back and watch it again. Again, I'm not, I'm not attacking Ken Hood. Okay? Not attacking him. I'm attacking these people that just insist on this ridiculous nonsense of a pre-wrath, post-trib nonsense. Okay? It's not a teaching of the New Testament. Not for the body of Christ. Here we have the Great Tribulation is the last three and a half years. Absolutely nonsense. Uh, look at this. Keep in mind that God does not cause the time of tribulation. Evil men do all of that. <sighs> See, you didn't just read that. Yeah, I just read that. Over here I have this little exclamation mark. Like, what? <laughs> uh Jesus Christ is the one that opens the seal that unleashes the Antichrist. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 8. 
I assemble the kingdoms, that I may pour upon them all my fierce indignation. God is the one that causes that time period. Why? Because the Jews have rejected Jesus as their Messiah. They say, give us another king, give us another Messiah. God says, okay, here's the Antichrist. Here's your false Christ. It's all there. Let's continue. The day of Christ, which starts with an earthquake and the sun and moon going dark, this is followed by the rapture of the dead in Christ, of the, the rapture of the dead in Christ, and any believer still alive up to the clouds. From Luke 18, verse 8, it seems there may not be many. This is when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith left on the earth. But let's look about this. The day of Christ, which starts with an earthquake and the sun and moon going dark. This is followed by the rapture of the dead in Christ and any believers still alive up to the clouds. Rapture of the dead in Christ. You know, you just compare Scripture with Scripture and you use right division and say, this is obviously not written to me. You can figure things out. Okay? Um, let's see, where are we at here? You can look through the whole chapter and you're not going to find this thing. But let's look here. Um, talking about the day and hour and everything else. Um, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Look here. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Uh, can dead people watch? No. Can uh, dead people, two of them be out in the field working? No. Can two dead people be grinding at the mill? Two women grinding at the mill? No. Uh, where's the resurrection of dead saints in Matthew 24? I'd like to see it, please. Mark 13. There's got to be dead saints here in Mark 13. I mean, it's got to be there. It's got to. It's just got to be there. Well, let's look. Okay, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. You know, and it goes down through there. Uh, again, you're told to watch, for you know not what hour, or for you know not when the time is. You know, watch ye therefore. How do dead people watch? Uh, could you please show me where the dead saints are resurrected there? I'll give you a hint. They're not. You say, what's this gathered together thing all about? Well, let's go to Luke 21. We'll see about this. Luke 21, verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Go down through the rest of the thing there. Um, where did uh, dead saints ever get the thing of looking up and watching? It's not there. Let me show you another problem passage that uh, Ken Hoven doesn't go to. Luke 17, um, verse 33. See it there, Luke 17, verse 33. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. By the way, that's a common practice in poor countries. That doesn't mean that they're sodomites. Okay, common practice, poor people that are poor, don't all have their own bedroom and their own, own king-size bed in it, okay? Uh, I was asked that. That's a good question. But um, one shall be taken, the other left. Verse 35, two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken, and the other left. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken, and the other left. Same thing we saw in Matthew chapter 24. They're living. But now here's where it gets really interesting. Look at this, verse 37. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord, where are they taken? 
Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. Uh, what's that a reference to? Revelation chapter 19. See, you know, like I said, it's this the, the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away is so easy to understand. It's so easy to believe in, okay, because it's just like you, you understand God saved me. He's not going to pour out his wrath on me. He's not going to judge me along with the lost world that's, that have rejected him. It's not consistent with Scripture. You know, you go back to Abraham. God's going to pour out his wrath on, on Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and Abraham says to God, shall not, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? If there are righteous men down in Sodom and Gomorrah, what are you going to do killing them? See? It's just a common understanding of Scripture. You just simply look and you go, it's so simple for me to see that the body of Christ leaves before this time of God's wrath comes. Okay? Before His judgment comes. i got to say that so people, yeah, the wrath is towards the end. Yes, we know that. We've heard your little arguments and they don't hold any water. But it's easy to understand. But see, when you get all these little attacks and all this little nitpicky stuff, that's when it gets difficult to defend this position. Not because the position is false, but because people come up with so many lies about it. They go all over Scripture to prove things and make a mess of Scripture and make a mess of your mind if you believe them. Okay? This is one of the ministries that the Lord has given me to defend the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away. It's the most significant upcoming spiritual event that's going to happen because it's going to confirm who was saved, who was lost. It's going to confirm to the Jews when God starts to deal, okay, here comes the Antichrist, boom, signs the peace treaty. Hey, look, the book of Revelation is true. And Moses and Elijah show up, the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11. Again, we're going to get into that as we continue. Um, they show up. They're confirming the word with signs and things like this. I mean, it's going to be a tremendous time for the nation of Israel. That's the whole purpose of it. I don't need to go into a time of purification as a Christian. All right? I can confess my sins between my Heavenly Father and myself. I don't need to have all kinds of purification and times of testing and whatever else. I don't need that. I don't need to endure the, to the end to be saved. But let's continue. Revelation chapter 19. Back to here where it says, um, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. Revelation chapter 19. Uh, and I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Okay? Right there. So where are they being gathered together? One shall be taken the other left, one shall be taken in the other left. Where, Lord? Where the body is, thither will the or wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. What is it? Right there. The Jews, at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, when they see that halfway mark where the abomination of desolation sets himself up in the temple, and he starts saying, I'm God, you worship me. Uh, he calls the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Again, uh, if the Christians are there for the first part of that thing, you know, uh, why are Christians sacrificing animals? Why the sacrifice and oblation? It doesn't make much sense. But he calls the sacrifice and oblation to cease. The Jews that are faithful and the remnant there that are going to be saved, they flee into the mountains. All right? And they're gathered together at the end towards the area there, the Valley of Megiddo and everything, where the final battle is going to be fought. They're going to be basically running away from the Antichrist and his army, and they're going to go out to try and wipe them out. See, the Antichrist, the Roman Catholic system, their goal, their desire, their greatest desire is to destroy the nation of Israel. If they can kill all those Jews, then God's promises can't come true. God's no longer God. His promises, he broke his promises. Satan would prove that he's a liar. The whole Bible falls apart. Blah, blah, blah. That's Satan's warped philosophy. But let's continue. We've got a lot more material to cover, and I'm just getting warmed up. <laughs> I'm trying to dedicate as much time as I can to this study because I know people are going to say, you didn't answer this, you didn't answer that, you know, if I don't. So that's why I'm trying to be as thorough as I can. But now look at this. 
the first 1040 days, a little less than three years, is the time of God's wrath being poured out in the form of the seven trumpet and seven vile judgments on the earth. The remaining 997 years is a time of blessing and peace on earth and goodwill to men as Jesus himself rules the world with a rod of iron from his throne in Jerusalem. Now what this bunch of nonsense chart here is showing, this is from Rasmussen. Again, I don't blame Ken Hoven for being deceived by this false prophet. He has, this is the time of Jacob's trouble here, the Daniel 70th week. Seven years where God's dealing with the church his church, his bride, the body of Christ, God's judging his own body, kind of odd, you know. Uh, our judgment comes in the judgment seat of Christ, but, you know, why be confused about that? But here you have, here, now this, this little blip right here is where God is dealing with the nation of Israel. They only get 1040 days. And it's kind of weird because, you know, how do the, you know, he says later on about, I don't really know where the two witnesses show up. They show up probably somewhere over in here so that they can witness for three and a half years, you know, like the Bible teaches in Revelation 11. You know, it, it's such a weird system. But, you know, right there he has it. So it cuts into the Millennial Kingdom. See the day of the Lord right there, a thousand years. So it cuts in. You have this little time period here, 1040 days, cutting into the Millennial Kingdom. So it actually works out to more like 997 years. Really. See, this is the problem when you start to go into all this wild mathematical equations and, well, you have to force this into this area and that into that area. I can't just, you know, say, I don't really know how this fits together. You know, that's our time here is for the church age. What goes on at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, I don't know how the Lord's going to work all, out all that stuff. No, you have to, I'm a scholar, so I'll fit it all in somehow. And you end up making the Lord a liar. I want to show you why this theory of the 997 years does not work. Revelation chapter 20. Okay, you go down through here. Verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Um, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a 997 years. Oh, no, I'm sorry, it's a, a thousand years. You see, ruling and reigning with Christ is a thousand years, not 997. You know, the first part of it, you know, the first three years, essentially, God's pouring out His wrath on the Jews, and then 997 years after that, then they, they rule with Christ or something. Huh? You see, Rasmussen's system there is calling God a liar. That's a problem. Again, Ken Hoven, you, you've been deceived by this Rasmussen guy. He does not know what he's talking about. And I'll be debunking his book in time when it comes. Uh, here, Satan is loose from his prison term. Okay? Kind of a weird way to put it, but uh, he's bound and cast in the bottomless pit for the thousand years, not 997. Again, a problem there. Appendix 6 is the time of the great white throne judgment of God Everyone stands before God and is judged. The saved are allowed to enter eternal heaven. What? You know? What? So, let me get this straight. Saved Christians, born again, bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, and we go up at the rapture, go through the judgment seat of Christ, we come back down, we rule and reign with Christ, we go through the marriage supper of the Lamb, uh, we rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years, and then we have to be judged again at the Great White Throne Judgment. Uh, no, the Great White Throne Judgment is for lost people. That's their final judgment, their final condemnation before they're cast into the lake of fire forever. Okay, there are no saved Christians at that judgment. So again, Ken Hoven is showing his ignorance of Scripture, and again, it's coming from Rasmussen. I don't blame Ken Hoven for that. I blame Rasmussen. And so we're just kind of paging through. He gets into a lot of the creation science stuff. And, and you know, again, creation science. Uh, Ken Hoven is, I think, the, the greatest expert out there on the whole creation science issue. I don't think anybody's any better than him at presenting it. And I really do pray that, that uh, Ken Hoven 
sticks with creation science and does not mess around with prophecy unless he gets straightened out. Um, because he's really, really, really far off on the thing of prophecy. Very, very, very bad. But let's continue. Here we have page 96. Uh, here we go. He says, Since God wants us to study, 2 Timothy 2.15, I asked him for wisdom. Uh, verse 18 said, The saints possess the kingdom. Then verse 21 said, The horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. How could this be? Okay, another one of the common things people will say, the Bible says that there are going to be saints in the time of Jacob's trouble, so the saints are Christians. No, 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 no. Saint is a generic term for saved people in any time period, any dispensation. All right. So to say there are saints in the time of Jacob's trouble, that proves that Christians must be there. No, no, no. All it proves is that there are saved people in that time period that they're called saints. That's all it proves. And by the way... Uh, if you want to talk about uh, the Antichrist making war, again, let's go to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. Uh, verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Talking about the two witnesses. So you have there the Antichrist making war against you know, the Jews primarily and the two witnesses in particular. But uh, Dr. Rasmussen's book, The Post-Trib pre Pre-Wrath Rapture, is, an, is excellent. And there he gives the website address for this nonsense. But you know, he'll say this over and over and over again. You know, Dr. Rasmussen's book is just wonderful. It's, ra it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Uh, Brother Hoven, you've been brainwashed. Okay. You've been mind controlled by this Rasmussen guy. He's a liar, a total, complete liar. And I suspect that there's probably going to be a lot more I find out about the guy as we dig it in into his quote unquote ministry. But here we have page 97, the next page. It says, by laying them side by side, it was obvious that verses 21 and 25 were adding the detail that the saints would be prevailed against or worn out before they take the kingdom. Uh, this discovery was the beginning of my transformation from believing in the pre tribulation rapture. Back to the historic position the church has taught for nearly 2,000 years. Absolute total lie. Dr. Hoven, you've been lied to. Namely, that we will be here for the tribulation, but will be raptured out before the wrath of God falls. Nonsense. Nonsense. The wrath of God starts with the unleashing of the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. That's when it starts. Okay? It's not the historic position of the church. And even Marvin Rosenthal, one of the two big guys of the whole pre-wrath uh, post-trib teaching even admits it's a recent teaching. It's not the historic position of the church. That's a lie. Uh, Revelation chapter 5, 11, okay, talking about, you know, the, uh, um, you know, the saints that are redeemed out of the blood and everything else that are up there in heaven before the Antichrist is unleashed. It seems to me that these are the ones who are killed for their faith and resistance to the Antichrist. See Revelation chapter 6, verse 11, and whatever else. Huh? So the people that are in heaven are there because they were killed by the Antichrist before the Antichrist is on the earth and revealed. Okay. This research led me to add Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, verses 8 through 28. As I've been saying... All these post-tribbers have to go uh, to the thing of the Gospels to try and prove uh, that the body of Christ goes into the time of Jacob's trouble. It's absolute nonsense. Absolutely nonsense. 102, page 102. Notice in verse 1 it says, Thy people, Jews, are going to experience a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. This is called the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? Talking about you know, there in the book of Daniel. And it's, of course, very, very true. The Jews, it's for the Jews. It is not for the body of Christ. Now look at this. Next page, page 103, verse 2 says, Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now that sounds just like 1 Thessalonians 4, 10, through 16, uh, 10 and 16 through 17, where the dead in Christ shall rise first. Hmm. Notice the order. Time of trouble in verse 1, then the dead in Christ rise, rapture, 
We'll see that order again in Matthew 24, blah, 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 in the Penix 40, the day of Christ. Uh, where's the dead in Christ rising? Here. It's not. It's not in the Gospels. Page 106, chapter 7 through 12, give lots of details about the final kingdom where Satan tries to rule the world, starting off with persecution of the saints and Jews. Uh -huh. Don't be surprised when Christians are not raptured out until the end of the tribulation time endure to the end. What if we don't? What if a Christian goes in and does not endure to the end? It's a big doctrinal problem for you. And that's why, you know, like I said, you get into this whole Christians going into this time period, Daniel's 70th week, you know, and whatever else you want to call it. Christians go into it, you get all messed up, terribly messed up in your doctrinal stance. You start to end up teaching a false, doc or a false gospel. It's bad. It says here, so Daniel said the next thing we need to watch for is a treaty that allows Israel to rebuild their temple. When that happens, we can restart the 70-week clock that was put on hold when... Israel rejected their Messiah nearly 2,000 years ago. We will cover more about that treaty and what happens after that in Appendix 4. Uh, no, the church is not going to be here. I thought this was interesting too. Here we have page 109. He talks about the scoffers are willingly ignorant of the coming judgment. And he basically is trying to make it into, you know, Christians. Those of us that are pre-tribulation rapture believers uh, that we're scoffers and we're Ill ignorant of the coming judgment when the passage is clearly talking about lost people page 110 you can see down there God graciously and lovingly gave me an extended vacation so I could focus on his word and study to show myself approved unto God and solve actually uh, rediscover what the church has always taught this end times puzzle Okay, uh, it wasn't the Lord there that gave you that time in prison. And uh, I love Dr. Hoven very, very much, but uh, messing around with the structuring and the, and the tax stuff and all that other stuff, um, you weren't put in there because you were preaching the gospel. And I, I respect uh, Ken Hoven very, very much, but when you start getting around that patriot stuff, and you start saying the income tax was never properly ratified and, and, you know, the whole, all that stuff. You need to be real careful. Okay, very, very, very careful. All right, and you say that the Lord put you in there so that you could study this issue and come out now and be against the time, the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away. I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, I'm glad that Ken Hovind is out. I hope he doesn't go back in. To prison again. I hope he stays out and actually goes after the atheist crowd out there, the evolution crowd and everything else. Stick with what you know. Stick with what the Lord's called you to do. Don't get messing around with this patriot stuff again. You're going to go right back to jail. But, you know, and again, rediscover what the church has taught, or has always taught. That's nonsense. Total nonsense. Again, I refuted that. Even Marvin Rosenthal says it's not true, and he's one of the biggest writers on the subject. Uh, let's continue. Then in about 2009, I was forced by the evidence to change my position back to the historic position of the church, that's a lie, and make some brethren angry. Some people mistakenly call the entire seven-year period the tribulation. It's not called the tribulation. No part of it's called the tribulation. Actually, only the last three and a half years is ever called the tribulation. That's not true. It's called there shall be tribulation after the tribulation of those days. This is never a title in Scripture. That is a lie. For most of the 2,000 years of church history, the church believed and taught that believers would be here on earth for the time of tribulation. In 1830, that changed as we will see below. Total lie. This is a total lie. You've been deceived, Ken Hoven. You've been totally deceived on this. It's a total lie. The majority of Bible believers worldwide and even in America, however, have always and still do today hold to the post-trib rapture teaching as we will explain you are lying, Ken Hoven, and you better be very careful because that is a lie. Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, it's like a broken record. You go to the Gospels uh, before Jesus even died on the cross, so you're doctrinally in the Old Testament. You say, I don't believe it. Again, I'm doing this study. A lot of you are probably going, 
just shaking your head going, yeah, I know this stuff already. You know, I understand that. But there are a lot of young Christians that have not seen these attacks and they get confused by it and everything else. And that's why I'm doing this study for the young believers out there. The book of Hebrews, written to Hebrews, you know, Jews. I believe that this is one of the two books. This one, Hebrews, and the book of James, written to the 12 tribes. You can look it up, the first chapter, you know, I think the first verse even, talks about to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting, you know. And this, these two books, I believe, are primarily doctrinally pointed at Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. But let's look here. Okay, verse 14, Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Zoom in a little bit better here. And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth when did the new testament begin with the death of the testator when was that jesus died on the cross that's why in the book of matthew you have people being told to go show yourself to the priest you know command the, the, the and do the sacrifice commanded by moses in the law it's right there why did Mary sacrifice two young turtle doves when Jesus was born? If they were Christians there in the early part of the book of Matthew, they weren't. And we're going to see later on, Ken Hoven comes out and just flatly denies that Matthew 24 is for Jews. It's disgusting. As I was dedicating many hours to this study several years ago, I was more and more convinced the preacher rapture idea did not fit with the verses I was reading. It doesn't fit up here. See? Again, it doesn't fit. That's called rightly dividing the word of truth. You look and you say, well, this is for us, but that over there is for the people in the time of Jacob's trouble. This was for the people in the Old Testament. I mean, just even the most basic reading of Scripture, you can see this. Back in the Old Testament, God is building a nation. There's political thing. He's going in there, go in there and have a war with them, kill everybody, you know, and all that stuff. It's a different setup sacrifice this animal and do this and that unclean until this time here and unclean until that and then you read the new testament it's not there see you see rightly dividing the word of truth so he says i read matthew 24 mark 13 luke 21 and it just doesn't line up with first thessalonians 4 it's not supposed to you know now look what he does here See, he's going, I'm confused over Scripture. What does he do? Does he just wait on the Lord or, or just actually lower your pride enough to say, uh, you know what, I don't know the answer. Lord, in your time, you show me. Okay? Now, what's he do? I asked my wife to send in the book by, or the book Dr. Roland Rasmussen had given me years before when I spoke at his church, but I did not take time to read. Finally, all the pieces came together for me. For me. So who was it that, that taught him and and brainwashed Ken Hoven right there this lying false prophet right here Ken Hoven read the book of a false prophet he did not read scripture and have the Holy Spirit wait on the Holy Spirit to instruct him what does the Bible say no no he went and he read Rasmussen and I'm showing you over and over and over again in this study you compare scripture with scripture with scripture with scripture I don't care what C.I. Schofield says. I don't care what Ruckman says. I don't care what uh, Ryrie or Tim LaHaye. Or, I don't care what any of them say. I don't need anything from those people. I read scripture. Continue. Thank you, Dr. Roland Rasmussen, for permission to use your charts and materials and for helping me fit all it all together without stretching or twisting any scriptures. I've been showing you he's been twisting scriptures the whole way through this book. Down here further, it says, Just as the evolution theory is the greatest hindrance to understanding modern science, see Seminar Part 4, I now feel that the pre trib rapture teaching was the greatest hindrance for me to understand what on earth is about to happen for heaven's sake. You've been lied to, Dr. Hoven. As I mentioned in the introduction, the pre trib rapture teaching began in 1830 when a 15-year-old girl named Margaret MacDonald from Port Glasgow, Scotland, claimed she had repeated visions. 
uh, from February 1st to April 14th, about part of the church being raptured out before the tribulation. Okay? And, you know, you get others, they'll say, oh, it's a John Nelson Darby and, you know, all that stuff. You know, the Plymouth Brethren and all this. Absolutely nonsense. Again, I have showed that there are quotations from some of those early church fathers that go way, 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 way back. You know, and they're saying that the church is going to be spared, they're going to be taken out before this time and all that stuff. I proved it in other studies. But even so, Rosenthal says, no, pre-wrath, post-trib is just a modern invention. <clears throat> Some pre-tribbers object, saying their doctrine can be found in writings from before this time. Dr. Roland Rasmussen refutes each of these bogus claims in Appendix D of his excellent book, The Post-Trib Pre-Wrath Rapture, available from Faith Blap, whatever place. Find it interesting, too, you know. You have Faith Baptist Church. What's Anderson have his? Faithful Word Baptist Church. Hmm, got a little faithful word from uh, Faith Baptist Church, you know, with his little programmer, Roland Rasmussen. Sure. But let's continue here. And I'm going to be debunking, by the way, Rasmussen's book when it comes. So don't worry about that. Since my position is what millions of believers have also taught for 2,000 years, I feel safer too. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Ken Oven, you're lying. You've been deceived. Your position goes back into the 1990s. I don't know when Rasmussen's book is written, but it's not that long ago. It's a brand new invention. Nobody taught this thing in the past. Millions of believers for the last 2,000 years. That's a lie. An absolute total lie. Come on, man. You know, one of the things that always impressed me about Ken Hoven was that he's very thorough with his research. And that's why I'm so distressed by this whole thing. I'm just going, you know, what happened to him in prison? And, you know, and, I, and when I say he was tortured in prison, that was an admission of him. They were putting him in solitary confinement, shipping him around like 30 different prisons. That's mind control. That's torture. So what happened to him? Why did they break him down into believing in this satanic nonsense? You know, and it is satanic, by the way, too, because it's, it's putting the body of Christ into a time of judgment where you can lose your salvation you know, by taking the mark of the beast. You can be unsealed, apparently. Um, it's also taking promises away from the nation of Israel. And the whole purpose for the time of Jacob's trouble, the whole purpose for this Daniel 70th week. So yes, it is a satanic lie. This, this here is a satanic lie, and Rasmussen is a satanic lie, and unfortunately, Ken Hoven is repeating the satanic lies of these two false prophets. And I'm hoping and praying that Ken Hoven is not too prideful to admit that he's wrong, and that he's been deceived. Because if he continues in this lie, uh, God's going to have something to say about that. Page 113, when Jesus came the first time 2,000 years ago, his disciples asked him plainly when he would come back and what sign they should look for. He answered them plainly in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. He told them to watch for the sign of the sun and moon going dark. Uh, then he would return to call out his bride. Uh, no such teaching in Mark, or Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. There's no mention of a bride. We're going to see about that later, too, there. But uh, <clears throat> what was I going to show here? Uh, oh, yeah. It says there, he told them to watch for the sign. The sign. Did you get that? And that's true, by the way. The sign of the Son of Man. Look in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 22. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Um, what were Jesus' disciples? Well, that's right, they were uh, Jews. The Jews require a sign. Who is he coming back for? The Jews that require a sign. What is the time called? Daniel's 70th week, the time of Jacob's, Jacob's, you know, Israel? Trouble? There? Uh, the Jews require a sign? Hey, Christian, let me ask you a question. Ken Hoven, or anybody that follows, follows his uh, teachings, what are you doing needing a sign? I don't need a sign. I just shall live by faith. 
page 114. My 44-year study has convinced me that the historic position that the church held to for 2,000 years is right. He keeps repeating these same lies over and over again. Remember, it's kind of funny because I learned from Ken Hovind back in his seminar. Uh, he talked about Hitler, where Hitler said about if you repeat a lie long enough, loud enough, often enough, the people will believe it. And yet that's exactly what Ken Hovind's doing. Kind of weird. They taught that the rapture, the catching away of the living believers when the Lord returns, happens after the tribulation, but before the wrath of God falls in the day of the Lord, as shown above. The majority of believers in the world today agree. No, they do not. The preacher rapture idea started by a 15-year-old Scottish girl in 1830 that I held to for 39 years, and that is held to by a very vocal minority today is wrong, wishful thinking, and will disappoint many, causing them to fall away. So, so bad to see a man, a great man like Ken Hoven, just getting so mixed up by false prophets out there, like Roland Rasmussen. I don't know if you ever read Rosenthal's book, but uh, Stephen Anderson as well. Okay, Appendix 4B, the first three and a half years. We will see later in Appendix 4E, the day of Christ, evidence that the day of Christ is the rapture on the day. The sun and moon go dark after the tribulation, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Shall the sun be dark and the moon shall not give her light? Obviously, the first thing to watch for is the new temple being built in Jerusalem. Why? I'm a Christian. I don't need a temple. My body is a temple. After the sun and moon go dark, the Lord appears to gather together his children at the rapture. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And he shall send his angels, and they shall gather together his elect. Uh, did you know that this term, Son of Man, does not appear in any of the Pauline epistles? Why? Because the Jews are looking for their Messiah to come through the lineage of David, King David. And I talked about that in my one study, how the Jesus is the only one who can uniquely fulfill that. Because of Jeconiah and all the other stuff going on there. But they're looking for lineage, a descendant, kindred purity. That's why Jesus is called the Son of Man to the Jew there in that time of Jacob's trouble. But to a Christian, he's the Son of God. You won't find the term Son of Man in the Pauline epistles written to us as Christians. Page 126. Why will people fall away from the faith? Matthew 24. Here we go again. Gives the events from the beginning of the tribulation up through the rapture. Keeps going to Matthew 24. Big mistake. Page 128. I believe one major cause of the falling away in the first three and a half years is going to be the fact that false expectations were not met. There are millions of Christians, especially in America, who believe the Lord will rapture them out before the tribulation or persecution comes. That's a lie, a total lie. Tell that to the Christians in China, Russia, Muslims, or Hindu countries where they are being persecuted and killed for their faith today. Tell it to the millions killed for their faith over the last 2,000 years. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs or visit websites like those there or other websites that track Christian persecution today. Okay, watch the pre-tribbers attack me now, you know. Um, well, again... When Christians have been persecuted down through the centuries and when they're being persecuted right now, is it God that's doing the persecution? No. In the time of Jacob's trouble, who is it that brings in that time? God does. Simple understanding here, people. This isn't very deep. But when you get into this thing of believing that the body of Christ goes into this time of judgment, this wrath time of wrath of God and it wrath begins at the very beginning as I've demonstrated earlier when you believe that you start to get all mixed up 